Most people around the world are well aware of the camp system in the Nazi Holocaust, but fewer people are aware of the camp system the United States had during World War II. Over 120,000 Japanese Americans were interned in 10 different camps throughout the western and central United States. Today, I am here at Manzanar War Relocation Center to take you on a tour of a concentration camp in America during World War II. Let's go and explore, come on. On December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked and America found itself at war with Japan. It whipped up hysteria on the U.S. West Coast that an invasion may occur and then Japanese Americans would quote unquote commit subversive activity. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. It allowed authorities to expel 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent, most of whom were born in the United States, to 10 war relocation camps. One of these was on the site of an abandoned agricultural town called Manzanar, which means apple orchard in Spanish. Manzanar was the first of these 10 camps to open in March of 1942. By mid-April, up to a thousand people had arrived, and by July, the camp population was near 10,000, mostly coming from the Los Angeles area. The first thing we have to do is to properly define what a concentration camp is and to make sure that we know the differences between the camps that we had for Japanese Americans and the camps that Nazis had. A concentration camp was specifically designed to put people into an area because of who they were, not because of any crimes they have committed. In Nazi Germany, the camp system was created to torture people, to execute people, to work them to death, and of course, to murder them in gas chambers. The camp system in America during World War II was nothing like that, and it's very important we understand the differences between these camps and the ones that the Nazis ruled. The camp was administered by the War Relocation Authority and was surrounded by a barbed wire perimeter fence. There were also eight armed guard towers equipped with machine guns. The residents lived in a 36-block residential area composed of 504 barracks. Each barracks was separated into four 20 to 25-foot rooms, where as many as eight people lived in each room. Conditions were less than ideal, especially in the beginning when there was no heating in the winter, and dust from frequent windstorms came through every open space in the wood. Each block had a mess hall, and the kitchen served up to 800 people a day. Many people enjoyed an activity of going from one mess hall to another, searching for the best food and chef. To combat this overcrowding, the War Relocation Authority issued mess cards matching a person's own block to the mess hall. From its first serving on March 21, 1942, to its last on November 21, 1945, the mess hall served over 28 million meals to 11,000 people. The mess hall also served as a site of meetings, dances, movies, and parties. Upon the closure of Manzanar at the end of the war, the wood from the building provided the residents with lumber for packing grades. Many blocks built gardens to make the wait line less boring, and they served as a source of block identity and pride. Many of these gardens had three distinct levels. At the bottom, trees were planted from nearby orchards, and a pond would be added to symbolize a lake or an ocean and at the top, a hill representing the mountains from which the water flowed. This garden was unearthed in 1999 from sand and sediment. To keep people busy every day, obviously they needed sports 
and sports at Manzar was extremely important. There were basketball teams, many baseball teams, and it became a very vital sector of life and entertainment for over the 10,000 people that lived here for the three years during World War II. Baseball was especially popular at the camp. More than 100 teams were created, including 14 teams for women. Seasons were established, leagues were created, and championship games were held. It was a way to prove their loyalty to the United States. Even with the guard towers serving as a constant reminder that people saw them as an alien threat. By late in the war, Manzanar was almost self-sufficient. With more than a thousand fruit trees, a hog farm, and a chicken ranch, Manzanar shipped food to other camps and even sold it on the open market. By 1945, the camp had produced 396,000 pounds of pork, 1.3 million eggs, and 26,000 pounds of chicken. Manzanar also included nine warehouses and shops, which produced equipment for the war effort, in another effort to prove their loyalty. The camp was turning out 6,000 camouflage nets a month for the military in 1942, and it also had a mattress factory producing 4,000 mattresses a month by 1943. All of the workers in these factories made $16 a month. The camp also had vital facilities. In July 1942, a 250-bed hospital opened with operating rooms, laboratories, a pharmacy, dental and eye clinics, a morgue, and even housing for the medical staff, most of which were Japanese Americans. The hospital also recorded 541 babies born and 150 deaths in the 70,000 cases documented from 1942 to 1945. A firehouse was also built with Ford and Dodge fire trucks that helped fight 91 fires. Firemen were paid $16 a month and fire chiefs being paid $19 a month. December the 6th, 1942 was a monumental day here at Manzanar. In what became known as the Manzanar Riot, unfortunately, the first Japanese Americans were killed by the American authorities. I will now explain to you the story behind this unfortunate event. It begins with these two men, Harry Weno, a popular union leader, and Fred Tayama, a deeply unpopular FBI informant and a member of the Japanese American Citizenship League. This organization supported two things that made them very controversial. They supported Executive Order 9066 in an effort to show loyalty to the U.S. government. And the group also believed that they spoke for all Japanese Americans born on American soil, called Nisei. On the night of December 5th, 1942, six men beat Fred Tayama. He later described what happened. I grabbed hold of one man, and his mask came down a bit. I was going to bite his ear off. I recognized the eyes that I saw when the mask came down. The man I recognized by his eyes was Harry Weno. A camp administrator arrested Weno and sent him to jail in the nearby town of Independence. The next day, a big meeting was held, with World War I veteran Joseph Kirihara quoted as saying, Shall we permit the police department to arrest and jail Mr. Weno on the questionable words of that sneak, Fred Tayama, or shall we unite and fight to have Mr. Weno, your benefactor, be brought back to Manzanar? Yes, we must. Kirihara led a march to the police station to demand the release of Weno. The camp director agreed to bring a Weno back to Manzanar for a hearing, if the crowd dispersed and no more mass meetings were held. When the crowd complied, Wena was brought back to the camp at 3.45 p.m. That evening, 500 people gathered to demand Wena be released. Many were singing Japanese songs, others were cursing in English, and the military police were called in. Some entered the jail, and Kirihara attempted to gain Wena's freedom. The crowd grew, and by 9.20 p.m., 
the military policemen had their backs against the wall of the police station. Rocks were thrown at the police, and so gas was thrown into the crowd. As the people scattered to get away from the gas, two military police thought they were being rushed and opened fire. Two people were killed and nine taken to the hospital. An investigation board cleared all blame from both the Japanese Americans and the U.S. soldiers because they had believed they were being rushed. The most consequential result of the riot was the implementation of the loyalty questionnaire to test the patriotism of the Japanese Americans and to isolate those deemed disloyal. Actor George Takei, whose parents were required to answer this questionnaire, explains the predicament faced by the Japanese Americans. So they came down with what was called a loyalty questionnaire, which in its, uh, on the surface sounds outrageous. After they've taken our property, our homes, our businesses, our freedom, and incarcerated us for a year, they want to test our loyalty. It was a series of about 40 questions, and every, everyone in, in these internment camps had to respond, everyone over 17 years of age had to respond to this, uh, answer the uh, questions in the loyalty questionnaire. A 17-year-old girl or a 80-year-old immigrant lady all had to respond to this questionnaire. There were two key questions that uh, the government wanted answers to. Question 27 asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? Can you imagine this question being posed to an 88-year-old immigrant lady or a 17-year-old girl? Question 28, and this was only one sentence, but it had two ideas. It said, it asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? Now, for a Japanese American, someone born and raised here, the word forswear your loyalty to the Emperor was very offensive because it assumed that by birth you were ingrained with a inborn loyalty to the em emperor. I mean, you know, you can't forswear something that doesn't exist. So that the government assumed that there was an existing loyalty just because we looked like this. And so if you answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, they were, uh, the, uh, you were also saying no to the first part. Will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you uh, answered yes, meaning Yes, I will be loyal. You were, aha, uh -huh, fessing up that you had been loyal to the emperor and the government had, uh, was justified in, uh, in putting you in an internment camp. It was, uh, it, it turned all 10 camps into turmoil. My father, as I said, was born in Japan and ineligible for citizenship by, by government, you know, decree. He said, gall. Uh, to ask me this after they, they've taken my property, my home, everything. I am, there's, they ta they've taken everything, but they, there's one thing that they can't take, and that's my dignity. I am not going to grovel before this government. And he answered no to those two questions. And my mother, I mean, you know, she's uh, a young mother with three young children, one a baby. You know, they expect her to go off and carry a gun and fight. No. She, she said, this is nonsense. I'm not going to subject myself to it. And she also answered no to those two key questions. And because of that, we were removed from uh, the uh, camp in uh, Arkansas to the camp in Northern California. And that's why they had three layers of barbed wire fence. We were disloyal. On May 16, 1942, the first of 150 Japanese Americans died in Manzanar. Eventually, 14 people were buried in the camp cemetery, and today, six of those souls remain. To honor all those who perished in Manzanar, the sole consoling tower was erected. During the over three-year period of its existence, Manzanar witnessed hundreds of babies being born, 
but at the same time, it also witnessed more than 150 people dying here at this camp. I am here at the cemetery, and right in back of me is the sole consoling tower that was constructed by 15 cent donations from Japanese families that were incarcerated here. It was constructed by two former inmates, one Buddhist and the other Catholic. And today, this memorial is synonymous with the entire camp and symbolizing what occurred here during World War II. Today, the monument is the focal point of organized pilgrimages to the camp. On the last Saturday in April, memorial services are held and remembrance speeches are given. On September 2nd, 1945, World War II finally came to a close with a Japanese surrender. With the conflict over, Manzanar was set to close, and the last Japanese American left on November 21st. Many went voluntarily, but some had to be removed by force, simply because they had no place to go. Each person was given $25 with the bus or train ticket of their choice. Within a short time, most of the structures of Manzanar were removed. The exceptions being the Seoul Consoling Tower and the Manzanar High School Auditorium. The site was declared a California state landmark in 1972 and a national historic landmark in 1985. In 1992, Manzanar National Historic Site was created by Congress and the land was given to the National Park Service from the city of Los Angeles. The creation of the historic site was not without its critics. Some people rejected calling it a concentration camp as treasonous against the United States. The California historical marker in Manzanar has been damaged by vandals, with the C in concentration etched out, and other marks of defacement all around it. So... That concludes our in-class field trip to Manzanar War Relocation Center. I really hope this opened up a whole new aspect about World War II for you and the plight of the 120,000 Japanese Americans that found themselves incarcerated here. As always, I hope you learned a lot, and of course, I'll see you on our next in-class field trip. Take care.